time, we just want to take a moment really to be honest about how we're carrying so much and we've felt some big things this week. For me, this coming Tuesday is my my third year, uh, my concussive anniversary. three years since I had a concussion that became post-concussion syndrome. And so my body has just been like really emotionally in that anticipation. So in addition to all the things happening in the world right now, so I know we're all carrying things. And so we just wanna be mindful of that. And so what have you been feeling or not feeling as you're avoiding it? And just wanna make space to be present with that letting us do that here in this space, letting it be held by God and held by one another. So friends, roll those shoulders back again and push out some good exhales. You can rest your hands on your heart as a posture of connection with yourself and with God. And as we sing, just let your own grief or rage, your own exhaustion, heartbreak, joy, numbness, all of it, just let, let it rise as we sing now. Take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Thank you for that, taking that moment. Oh, and um, man, my body is its having a harder time today. I have this pulsing in my left ear, like as my heart beats. And so my brain's not on, on, not on all cylinders today, but I'm here and I'm with you. So thank you for hanging with me as we spend this time. Man, so I wanted to tell you about how back in June and July, I was part of an awesome book study small group here at Salt House. So shout out to Macy and Sarah and Don and Joelle as we had that time together. We read the book Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. I see some nods. Um, it's a really fantastic book. We met on Don's back deck, and it was like my first time like being with people. You know, it was like, oh my God, you're right here. You know, so we were, yay for vaccinations. And um, it was so great, and we just got really deep in that time together. And they are just so wise and funny, and it was really lovely. Not to mention that the book was wildly insightful and pertinent and transforming for this moment that we're living in as we understand what stress is and how we move through it. So the book, Burnout, it's co-authored by twin sisters, doctors Emily and Amelia Nagowski. And uh, it's a research-based book, but it's, it's really entertaining to read. But it's also packed with such good things for living a life of faith. Like for a life following Jesus, there's like really good stuff in there. So I just want to offer one little nugget that's nestled in the middle of this book. And it's a connection that they make about connection. So based on a wide range of research, the Nagowskis uh, make this point. That social connection is a form of nourishment. It's like food. 
connection is like food. And the science about it is staggering. So they, uh, so they, there was a study done um, just looking at how we physiologically need it in our lives. Um, man, uh, so if you've, you've likely heard of the effects of isolation on babies, how uh, being alone for an infant isn't just lonely, it's a matter of life and death. Like, babies will literally die uh, of loneliness, even if every one of their other needs is met. So you can just let, like, let that sink in. So it's a form of starvation. That's how intense loneliness is. We get sicker and die without connection. All right, so here's, here's the study. So in 2015, there was this big study looking at 70 different studies. So it's over 3 million research participants from around the globe. And they found that social isolation and loneliness increased a person's odds of an early death by 25 to 30%. Social isolation and loneliness increased a person's odds of an early death by 25 to 30 percent. Another study describes loneliness as having the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. I mean, what? And yet, like common wisdom for us, if we think about the things that we're told, common wisdom is that development should be a linear progression from dependence to autonomy, right? Like we move from this place of needing people to not needing people. And when psychologists began forming theories about human development, they concluded that it's immature to depend on others. So the best, like strongest, sanest, smartest, and most grown up people, they said, are those who don't need anyone to do anything for them. And it remains popular wisdom that healthy people that, you know, we should feel 100% whole with or without a romantic partner or the approval of others or the support of a family or community. Social connections should just be like this bonus that's on the side. Or like, I'm good, but I also have this thing on the side. So instead of being like a staple of our diet, it's more like a supplement. But the Nagowskis say that counter to everything that we've been told, that here is the heretical truth. No one is complete without other people. And they mean this literally. To be complete without social connection is to be nourished without food. It doesn't happen. We're only complete with other people. We get hungry and we get lonely. We must feed ourselves or die, both food and social connection. So this doesn't mean you need a man or you need a woman or any kind of romantic partner. This just means that you need connection in any or all of its varied forms in varying ways across your lifespan. Side note, autonomy is really important also. It's also true that the lifelong development of autonomy is as innate to human nature as the drive to connect. So we need both connection and autonomy. So, and that's not a contradiction, it's both and, right? And we are actually built to oscillate between the two, between connection and autonomy. So again, this is all from the research discussed in the book Burnout by doctors Emily and Amelia Nagowski. And of course, I bring this up now because holy buckets, because of COVID, we have been forced into autonomy, right? Without access to many of our usual social connection points for a really, really long time. Like that healthy oscillation between autonomy and connection, it's so hard right now. And I wonder for you as you, like, how do you feel right now as you hear this? Do you feel validated to like, look, there is research that supports. This is how I've been feeling. This has been my experience of loneliness. Or maybe you just feel more worried because you're like, great, I was feeling lonely. Now I'm like 25 to 30% more likely to die. Like, thanks for that. Like, great. Uh, or maybe it is of great comfort because you're thinking, yeah, I have felt malnourished. Like, that, that's exactly what this has felt like. And goodness, it's helpful to know why I have felt like I'm starving. My friends, this is certainly true for me. Like, I have been starving. How about you? Social connection, necessary for life. There's the science to prove it. Then there's also the life of Jesus that reveals it too. This God that we know in Jesus came to us as an actual, relatable human person to affirm, embody, and demonstrate how our faith is a relational reality, showing us that love, 
lived out in relationship with others is the very life of God. So no, I'm not surprised that this is what science confirms too. So last Sunday, we began a conversation about how we look at Jesus's life and there's this relational pattern to it. Jesus spent time in three primary relationships. He had three great loves. We visualize it on an equilateral triangle, how Jesus spent time up with God in prayer and in communion with God. I hope that you had time to notice and play with how you experienced that connection with God this past week. Hopefully worship right now is also an experience of that, right? Jesus also spent time in. He had his disciples, his friends, with whom he gathered and just did life with together. Then he also spent time out, out in the world engaging with the needs and the suffering and the sickness and systematic oppression and broken systems, all for the sake of those who were in need. And he held all three of these relationships in balance, up, in, and out, and were invited to feed our hunger for connection by tending to each of these relationships also. Jesus' pattern of having these three great loves can also be present in our lives too. So as for our in relationships, we've already started, we already mentioned it at the beginning, that's our conversation for today. So friends, I know for some of us, you know, we're doing well with our social connections, or at least okay, but many of us are starving for connection. We're sad, there's some despair, we're depression, we're alone, and maybe not all the time, but it's there sometimes. And so today we want to listen for what the Jesus story has to say and what we can do about it. So let's dive in to our in relationships in this global moment when we're all so hungry for it, okay? Okay. So, just to get us oriented, our in relationships are, you know, those folks that we're closest to, right? It can be friends, family, coworkers, teachers, church community, affinity groups that we're a part of. People often ask the question about like, my family, I'm not really close to them. So it gets, family can be hard. and it may, So they may not be included in who you really think are those in relationships for you, and that's okay. I picture my in relationships as like a set of concentric circles around me in a way. Some folks are closer, some are farther, some kind of overlap in different ways. People ebb and flow in different ways. So that's who we're talking about with our in, and it looks a little bit different for everyone. But looking at Jesus' in, he had a tighter-knit group of friends, Peter, James, and John, who he was particularly close with. He did some special things with them. And then the 12 disciples, Jesus spent more than 50% of his time with his disciples and no one else. Hello, social connection, right? He also had friends like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So for our purposes today, we're actually going to look at how Jesus' relationship with his disciples was modeled and carried into the next generation of Jesus followers. Since we can't be with Jesus now, let's kind of look at what his followers did when he couldn't be with them anymore either. So what did that connection look like at that time? So for our text today, just to set it up, it has just been Pentecost, Jesus offering that gift of the Holy Spirit, which was his presence with them in a new way. And before that, Jesus had been resurrected, right? And then he had spent weeks in his community just teaching the apostles and uh, before then returning to God. So now this community, you know, they're left on their own without Jesus' physical presence for the first time. So what does social connection look like without Jesus physically there? So notice the picture that we get as that's painted for us, what life together was for them and how it can inform our life together in now. So here's Danny reading for us. We are reading from Acts 2, 42 through 47. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Everyone around was in awe, all of the wonders and signs done through all the apostles. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal, a celebration. Exuberant and joyful as they praised God. People in general liked what they saw. Every day their number grew as God added those who were saved. Thank you, Danny. So we're going to spend time in that first verse, Acts 2.42. 
where it says they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. It says they committed themselves or they devoted themselves to kind of these four things. And we're going to look at each and hear them as describing activities that can engage and energize our in relationships as well. So there are a number of questions that we're going to ask of each other um, that get to kind of general ways to think about it. And then you get to dream up what those specifics look like, you know, what it looks like in practice for you. And so really the intent is to actually have some space to reflect. We're going to rip through it pretty quickly, so also come back to it maybe. Um, but to reflect it and then actually have some answers and to hopefully lead each of us into action and social connection on the other side of this conversation. So we're both going to kind of say a lot and miss a lot of things that could be said. So I just want to take a moment to breathe and just invite God still into this conversation God, we just ask you to keep speaking to us in whatever way we each need to hear, even beyond the words that will be spoken. So we're all listening for kairos, right? These moments that get our attention for something there that God says, hey, pay attention to this. So this is our practice for this fall and for today too. So we're asking for kairos about our in connections, okay? Okay. So if you don't have a bulletin and you would like one, there's some stuff printed on there. The questions are there. So can you just raise your hand if you need a pen or a bulletin and we'll get that to you. Um, thank you, Anne. Folks at home, papers, fine. The bulletin is online if you want to see it or print it, but paper is also good. Um, but I encourage you to make notes as we go through this because I love how God kind of plants things. Whoop, like stuff comes up, we want to catch those. All right, so as we get settled then, let's... Listen together. So first up of these four things we'll pay attention to, it says they devote, devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. So the community of Jesus followers, this group of friends, they were committed to learning more about Jesus. So they were attentive to the apostles because these were the 11 guys who had been with Jesus and then Barnabas joined them as well. So I just, you know, I picture them just hanging out together, eager to hear the stories of Jesus's shenanigans and walking along with them and learning from the things that they had learned from Jesus, which makes sense, right? What do we know about learning? We learn best like from other people, right? That's why Pastor Ryan had us enter the, the Jesus Dojo this August, right? Recognizing that we always need an example to follow and then a way to practice. It's why we also see so many DIY videos everywhere. I mean, who watched one this week to do something, right? Like, they're just everywhere. So much of what we have, who we have become, also has been shaped by others, right? By our parents and our family, our friends, our teachers, our coaches, by how they have shown us how to live and be human. This is true for our whole lives. It's not just, you know, when we're little, which means to grow in relationship with Jesus now, it happens through folks who are showing us what this looks like, even now, during COVID. So this is a significant piece of our in-relationships, that connection of learning together, folks showing us how to live like Jesus. So I invite you to ask yourself, and the question's there in the bulletin too, in this season now, who is showing you the way of Jesus? And if you don't have an answer for that, which is okay, again, we are just trying to survive a pandemic, so it's okay. Uh, but another way to ask it is simply who could? Who could be someone who can show you that way of Jesus that you can learn together with? One possibility of learning is absolutely our small groups that are kicking off in October, a tremendous way to grow and connect and learn together, like I did with my book study with those ladies reading Burnout. So could one of our groups work for you? So we'll say more about that later, and those are all online. But that's a question, right? Who could it be now? So our in, it includes people who show us what life, what the life of God is like, and we learn together. All right, so that's the first thing. Again, we're just going to move quick. So here's number two. It says they also devoted themselves to the life together. Other translations here often say the common life or fellowship. They enjoyed life together, the good and the bad, right? So our first question about this is just simply, you know, with all the current limitations, who do you, or again, who could you, who do you do life with, share life with now? And this is, you know, of course, there's people in our own household, and those relationships are a vital part of our in relationships, but also ask that question about those outside of who we live with right now. So who are those folks that we're doing life with or could do life with? Another way to dream about that is to ask, who would you want to spend time with if there were no limitations right now? 
and then start dreaming, right? How can you find a way to make that work in some way? The text also says how they lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. So the picture that is painted of life together is also one of generosity. Notice that there's both giving and receiving. This is just a crucial piece of our our social connections are in as well, the giving and the receiving, the mutuality that is there. An overwhelming number of us, we have trouble being honest and vulnerable about the, the real need in our lives, whether it's tangible, like financial need, or when we are in need of like love, prayer, a hug, acceptance, friendship, forgiveness. Or right now, it's hard to be honest about how lonely we feel at times or what our real struggles are through this time. So I wonder about you. In what ways is it natural for you? In what ways do you struggle to both receive and to give? That mutuality of giving and receiving, you know, that's, that's the kind of intimacy God wants for us in our life together, to be seen in our needs. So the questions that we have written down there are these. In what ways or with whom are you giving in your relationships? And how about receiving? How do you struggle to give or receive, especially at this time? Or just like a general question, it just this is a crazy time we're living in. So what does God want you to hear about this, this dynamic of mutuality and giving and receiving? And so I, I know I think a lot of us have a lot of needs, so this isn't meant to be a question. These are curious questions, not, not one that's intent to shame us, but to let God meet us in the curiosity that we have while reflecting on how we're doing, recognizing that we all likely have needs right now, right? Okay. Third, they devoted themselves to the common meal, So this is often translated the breaking of the bread. So the community ate together. The text also says that they had meals at home, every meal a celebration. And although this is a piece of what life together looks like, right? Like who who are we doing life with? Like eating together is a piece of that. But it's of such significance that eating together is mentioned separately. Do you know that the word companion is comprised of the Latin prefix com, which means with, and then P-A-N-I-S, which means bread or food, meaning with bread or with food. So our companions then are literally those with whom we share bread or food. The connection that happens with food is of a particular quality. As we say and we practice here at Salt House, good and sacred things happen when we eat together. And for the Acts 2 community, as they engaged in this, the meal included the remembrance of Jesus. So it is for us, in every meal we share, we can include uh, Jesus in the tables that we gather at, including at Jesus' table here in worship, feeding our hunger for food and feeding our hunger for connection with others, both as we are also met by and remember Jesus, right? So food is sacred, especially when we share it with our companions, right? which is so hard to like physically make happen right now, right? Oh, so I wonder what creativity have you already tried in eating safely in the last 18 months? What could you try now? How could your hunger for companionship be fed in meeting also your hunger for food, right? I'd love to see ideas in the comments too about things that folks have tried either now or later. Just let let us see those. But the questions that are in the bulletin for you to consider are who are or who could be the ones you have food with? Who are your companions right now in this season? Who could be your companions? What can that look like this fall and winter as everything turns to darkness and rain? Like how do we find connection over food now? All right, still with me? Fourth and finally... They devoted themselves to the prayers, it says. So these first followers of Jesus were devoted to prayer together. They spent time up, right? Connecting up together. It's so intimate and connecting to pray for or with someone else. Have you experienced that? Just before worship, I was not, I'm not feeling good today. And I was so grateful for Kim, just like, boom, she just prayed for me. Praying together is like a feast of connection. Our intimacy with God and our intimacy with each other, it grows in that moment. And maybe you've never prayed with another person before or never prayed out loud, or maybe you have an active prayer life with others. Wherever you find yourself, 
there's like kind of a next step that, that is appropriate in your prayer life. And the encouragement I offer you is to lean into God's grace and take that next step in prayer, whatever that looks like for you, okay? So the question there in the bulletin, are you in prayer with others? If so, who? And if not, who could it be? If prayer feels like an overwhelming or uncomfortable task, stay tuned. In January, we're, we're planning to do a prayer training, so, so plan to be there, but also you don't need to be trained to pray. So if this is new or newer to you, or it's just been a while, or you're just not sure how to pray anymore in the midst of some deconstruction that you're living through, I would just invite you to experiment and see what God does, okay? Okay. So that's all four things, and that was like really fast and furious, right? <laughs> Woo! So we just ripped through a lot of content, a lot of curious questions, and I really invite you to still hold those questions as you head into this week, too. But there you have it. These are four just dynamics of life together, of, of the in of that first group of Jesus followers, and it's not a complete picture, yet it's these four practices that offer a dynamic, vibrant life of faith together in social connection. And it met them and it meets us in our hunger for connection too. And I, I look at all this and as I start to think about it, I'm like, wow, this is like so awesome. And I'm like, wow, this is like so much, <laughs> right? Especially because I know for me, even as I'm starving for connection, it's like I'm standing back and looking at this beautiful buffet of options of what I could do to connect with others. And man, I, I just see it. And I want to engage in that feast. Like I see these questions and I'm like, oh, that looks great. But mustering the energy to actually dig in, it just feels like so much. Like I feel so rusty with connecting, even as I want it. Like anyone with me. Yeah. So I'd like to be able to promise that God can just like swoop in and fix it for us and like make connect connection happen for us. But the only way forward into connection is for us to actually take a step. I do know that God will meet us in that effort, but it's going to take effort. But hear this too. It just takes be beginning with one thing, right? Like again, here's, I've had like fire hose of here's some things to think about. What are you going to do? So it's been a lot of possibilities. I hope that you heard God giving you ideas and encouragement and insight. But start with just one thing that can impact your in relationships, that social connection that you need like food. And don't worry, like don't worry if it's the right thing. Just like try one thing that came up for you today that you can say yes to for connection. And then commit to making that happen this week. A reminder, too, that one of our four initiatives here at Salt House in our Leap of Heart campaign, which is our amazing financial commitment that we pledge to together, our yes to expand the impact of what God is doing in and through us this year, one of those four things is about connection specifically. We already knew, right, that our lives depend on it, and we made it one of our four initiatives that we're committed to investing in, especially this year. We said it this way, we said, we wanted to prioritize our growth and community at Salt House to belong here, knowing that in relationship with others is where we grow. And we all said it, yeah, we all said yes to investing in this, and we're doing it, so now's the time to sign up for it and participate in that investment with our small groups this fall. Also in two weeks, we're gonna share opportunities to serve and volunteer here at Salt House in meaningful ways, whether you're here physically or at home, to find ways to connect in that way. So we're building that connection together because to be complete without social connection is to be nourished without food. It does not happen. We are only complete with other people. God made us in love and for love. Joining that book study on burnout with the ladies, man, that was a place of love that sure nourished my soul, kept me alive. What are you hungering for? What is God saying to you about connection? And what are you gonna do about it? Friends, let's pray. God, you have made us to know your love and to extend that love in relationship with others. It is the sustenance we need, a steady diet of learning and eating together and doing life together and praying together. So God, we let ourselves be honest about the ways in which we feel parched and starving. 
So in these next moments, we continue to abide with you and listen for what you are saying to us, even just one thing about our in-connections and what we'll choose to do about it. So God, thank you that we have you and each other as we say these yeses together. Amen. Amen. Uh, we...